Welcome into a, another episode of Suds with Bloods on the Dub Network. Uh, today, I have another former teammate, three-time Stanley Cup champion, three Selkie Award winner or trophies for best defense to forward in the NHL, a former coach, an analyst, uh, apparently a coach for some <laughs> up three on three on three probably getting a good paycheck for oh yeah and one other thing uh he is a member of the nhl's hall of fame Guy carbono carbo how you doing did i miss I'm anything, doing, uh, is there anything else? uh no i don't think so i haven't you wouldn't checked. tell me if there was i anyway. haven't checked exactly i'm doing good i'm doing good yeah uh, so you know, uh, that How's Lynn and the kids and everybody? Grandkids? Uh, the kids, Lynn is doing really good. Uh, she's still uh, horseback riding uh, pretty much every day. And the grandkids and the kids are back in Dallas and they're yeah. doing extremely well. Speaking of Dallas, how often do you get here? I uh, try to go a couple times a year. I, I oh, mean, obviously, uh, obviously, with the COVID, uh, it was kind of hard to travel, but uh, I'm sure we'll have a chance to go back in a couple times a year. I'm, uh, I was thinking of this last night. I would like to get your son-in-law on here that I'm sure we'll talk about <laughs> here. And then I thought, well, maybe that would be a cool thing to do if Carbo comes into town to get them both in our studio. We have a little studio yeah. here that we do, and today I'm doing it from my house before I got to get on the ice. So um, that would be that would be yeah. a great uh, thing, I think, if we could do that. So uh, first, first thing I want to do, Carbo, I, I saw something on the Internet or somewhere. Tell me about this three-on-three league. Like, what is this about? And why haven't I been invited? Um, well, first of all, like I think uh, it started with uh, Craig uh, Patrick, uh, the ex GM in Pittsburgh, and E. J. Johnson, which is uh, Eddie Johnson's uh, son. Uh, they had a vision about you know four years ago. Uh, I think they you know everybody saw the three on three in the NHL and American League, and and uh, it's really popular and I think exciting. Uh, and their idea was to start a league. Obviously, COVID kind of backtracked that a couple of years, but uh, we got, we, I got a call from EJ about three years ago, uh, told me about a project. Um, you know, I think everybody was kind of on the edge at the, at the beginning. And I told, I said, uh, keep, keep your work going. Uh, and as you go along, uh, keep contacting me. And uh, I think, you know, like, you know, John LeClaire is in there, Grant Fuhrer is in there, Brian uh, Trotti, uh, Joe Mullen, and Larry Murphy, and myself. So we, there was a six teams, uh, six coaches. Uh, we had a little training camp in March in, uh, in Vegas, uh, where about oh, 40... Oh, there's a surprise. <laughs> yeah, where 40, about 40 guys that uh, EJ and Craig uh, recruited uh, over the last couple of years, um, obviously because of COVID, there was a couple of guys that couldn't make it and uh, fewer Europeans uh, didn't have a chance to come. But, you know, we had a little training camp there, so we had a chance to see some of the guys. And then from there, uh, we had a, a, a draft uh, where we built six teams. So it's six players and one goalie. And we had about six or seven extra guys that traveled uh, with the team just in case there was injuries or problems. So, and then uh, the schedule was eight weekend, nine weekends, uh, the ninth weekends being the final where the top four teams uh, got together. And then we went from uh, first week was in Vegas, second week, Denver, uh, Grand Rapids, Pittsburgh, uh, Hershey, uh, London, Ontario, Nashville, uh, Quebec City, and then uh, went back for the final in Vegas. Uh, and every weekend was a little uh, little tournament where you know all six teams kind of had a, a chance to play. Uh, the winner kept going, and the players were paid on their performance every weekend. And uh, uh, the last weekend in Vegas, uh, four teams, the winner, each player is made one hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars U.S. Oh my, oh my. Yeah. So now, like, how are they getting, like, so on average, like, do they get paid to play just to they, be on the team or a salary or what? Yeah, I think they, they each player had a weekly salary. Uh, and then every weekend, like I said, uh, there was, uh, there was, you know, best teams had so much money. And then I think it was a little bit, you know, it wasn't $127,000 every weekend. But, you know, I think that, 
players were really happy. I think they were excited. They, uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, you know, for the coaches, it was fun to kind of be together. Obviously, you know, again, with the COVID, traveling was kind of a little hard on everybody. But uh, overall, I think everybody was uh, uh, was fine with it. Uh, we'll see where it goes. I think their idea is to make it uh, just like the NHL or the American League, uh, a league where every year um, they're going to be on. And I think, you know, if they come back, and I'm sure they will come back uh, next summer, uh, I think more players uh, that were sitting at home uh, will jump in. So are, are these players that are currently on, they, they don't have NHL contracts, do they? No, it's, it's anybody that doesn't have NHL contracts. So we had a few, like Ryan Malone that played in the NHL, uh, Aaron Palusha that played in the NHL. There was a couple guys. Uh, my goalie was Martin Brother's son, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, guys that play in Europe uh, at the end of their career or they had a chance to come back and play. So, you know, I, I, I see, you know, you see it every day now in the NHL, guys retiring, P.K. Subban. Now that P.K. Subban is retired, he, he, would be, he would be on the list. I'm sure, you know, if he, if he wants to play uh, eight weekends or four weekends, depending on what the schedule is going to be next year, uh, he can jump in. So I got two things on that. So do you have sponsors? And then yes. let's say a guy like PK wants to come and play. Obviously, name recognition would bring yeah. for fans and things like that. Do the fans pay for these games to come in? And yeah. if you get a guy like PK, is it like the NHL where you're going to get paid more than somebody else or is it just all performance-based? I, I think, you know, I think this year, I, I, I don't know how the uh, – but all the coaches were paid the same. I, w I think all the players were paid the same. Uh, like I said, I think the sponsors is on CBS Sports. Uh, it was on TSN. It was on RDS. Uh, you know, there's a, they have one more year of contract for TV rights, and after that, it's on the open market. So they were hoping that money was going to get – you know, it's going to follow. Obviously, if we have guys uh, with more – visibility you know obviously contract going to be so i mean it was going to be individually in five years i don't know how it's gonna it's gonna end up but uh i think they were pretty excited they were happy there was I, obviously we played on saturday afternoon uh from 3 to 6 30 uh on different cities so it probably maybe not the best times you know for 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 people to get in so there was maybe between two and four or five thousand people in the in the building, which you know were paying customers. But uh, I would imagine if they, you know, they, they'll probably try maybe to go back twice in the same place to create an interest. Uh, they'll they'll change a little bit of the format in the in the years to come to to make it more interesting. But obviously they wanted to make it uh, as a professional team's uh, league. So uh, obviously people that come in and pay will dictate, you know where they go from there i i heard the cities i didn't hear montreal is there any no any, like why not montreal it seems like that would be a place where the fans would be there to watch this well i mean a lot of the places we play like in nashville we play in the big in in, in the big rink uh, denver we were in the american league same thing in vegas uh you know in quebec city we play in the video trial so which was the big uh so it, it's you know they were trying to create an interest i think they they went around different cities to see their the interest of the city and the interest if they can you know they can fit um i don't think montreal was on that list because it didn't fit at the time but you know who knows in the future well i don't know i'm sure i'm never gonna get invited <laughs> um, <clears throat> well it's not like well, it, it, well it's, it's pretty it's actually really fast so i don't know Right. Be fast Wait a second. <laughs> They'll be throwing stones around here. Right? I, I'm not. I'm, yeah. I wouldn't be like, I wouldn't be able to play it out. So. Yeah, I know. But, you go, but we could both still out and go out there. Probably <laughs> right. get yeah. away and block a few shots. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah, that's and, for sure. Um, okay, so let's talk about Geek Carbonell. Um, Shakuta me. I yes. was. Uh, you played. Uh, I think it was four years. You played there. four years. Yeah. Oh, first, first thing I want to do before we talk about that, can you explain? Because obviously we have a lot of people here, not everybody from Canada is going to listen. to explain the, the the three leagues and you know the 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 Q and the yeah, yeah. and and the difference in them. Well, there, there's they're all junior major. Uh, they all have the same age content, so which is like 16 to 19. Uh, I think there was exceptional 
status status that yeah. were given over the years where a kid can play at 15. Uh, like Crosby, uh, I think uh, Tavares, uh, McDavid, there's a couple of guys like across. But, you know, we have uh, a league in Quebec City, uh, in Quebec, a league in Ontario and a league out west. Um, you know, and they draft within their provinces uh, and then they have a territories in the States. And then there's a European draft that, that happens every year. And the Europeans goes, uh, they, you know, the, the agents tell them, tell the leagues which player are, wants to play in Canada. And then there's a draft going from the worst team in Canada. So that involves all the other teams, all, all the, the three leagues. You know, from the worst to the best, and then you no. Know, so that's how they draft the Europe, the Europeans, and then each have their own uh, championship. And then at the end of the year, uh, all three leagues are get together for the Memorial Cup, and that involves the three winners of the championship in each league plus the the hosts of the city. And that's when there are hundreds of scouts at the Memorial. <laughs> that Cup. yeah. Exactly. Uh, you know, but, but like most of, most of the times, uh, you know, kids are, are, are getting scouted pretty much throughout the year. Yeah. Um, equally, uh, the only difference, like, uh, you get drafted in, in, in Canada in junior major at 18, just like, uh, the Bro. guy that you guys, like when you play in NCAA, yeah. the only difference is, uh, when they draft in Canada, you have two years after you draft the kid to sign him where in the U.S., uh, a kid can stay in university for four years and then after that, make a decision. So those three leagues, is there different styles of playing them? Because I, I always thought you were in the Quebec Major Junior. Yeah, right? yeah. Is that more offensive league versus the Western League, or are they all pretty similar? I think in, I think uh, earlier in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, there was a little bit more different. Uh, I think uh, in Quebec, they were saying that we were a little bit more offense, uh, smaller players, uh, and they're, the scouts and the teams in the NHL had tendencies to pick up guys from Ontario and out west because they were bigger, uh, stronger. They say they were easier to, to mold into the defensive player that they want. I think over the years, it changed a lot. Um, you know, I think everybody now understands the game a little bit more with the videos and things like that, the systems. Um, I think you're just trying to pick up the, the right, the best, the best players and, and uh, make the best teams you can. Well, you talk about molding them into defensive players. I, I look at your numbers and <laughs> the last two years you played, <laughs> holy shit. I mean, the last year you had 141 points, or no, you're second That's, to last. It is, you had 141 points and you had 182 points. And then yeah. all of a sudden, you start going and you make your way to Montreal and you become this defensive dude that just yeah. wins trophies year after year. So what was there was there a big transition there? But but you were still scoring what yeah. fifteen to twenty goals yeah. a year. Yeah, exactly. There was, did there was something tell you that Carbo that here's how we want you to play, or did you just understand that? Because we started well. You yeah, played almost, a couple of games, I think, the year before you yeah. and I were there. You know, right? You played two games and went back to Nova Scotia, and yeah. then you and I started together. But I always thought that you were that guy when you came in. So how do you go from 182 points and then be the guy that plays against the top offensive centerman when you come into the NHL? Well, I think over the years, like, you know, when I was a kid, uh, even in the American League, when I played in the American League, like I was, you know, I, I finished in the top – five in, in my first year and top 10 in scoring my second year. So I, I kind of, I, I knew my ability to, to put points on the board. Um, I think obviously you, everybody wants to make the NHL and, you know, as you saw it, like, you know, in 82, when I started to play in, in Montreal and Bob Berry was a coach, uh, you know, I was playing on the fourth line. I was playing maybe, uh, you know, four or five minutes a game, <laughs> like all the young guys. Uh, yeah. which, which was frustrating, uh, because, you know, all my life I played 20, 25 minutes a game. Uh, and then, uh, I think when Jacques Lemaire came up, uh, and became the coach of the Canadians, uh, his vision of a team, because that's what he was doing with the Canadians. He played with Gila Fleur and Steve Shutt, but he was always kind of the guy that kind of hang back a little bit and, and take care, took care of the defense. 
he, he, he wanted to build a team where you had two really good offensive line and one good defensive line where, you know, this line can play against anybody. And, uh, you know, I, so we had a meeting. He had a meeting with me, told me what he was looking for. And he told me, like, listen, you're going to have to kind of sacrifice a little bit of the offense. But, you know, I went from four minutes to 20 minutes a game. So I, that was a pretty easy transition for me. And like you said, like, I, I figured over the years that by playing well defensively, I created a lot of, you know, turnovers. And then with those, those turnover, turnovers, I was able to put points on the board. So it wasn't a really a huge transition for me. Uh, you know, I, I thought about it at some time, some points where, you know, what if, what if I would have played on the top two lines with some better offensive players? Yeah. Uh, it probably would have been different. But, you know, like you said, in our years, uh, we battled for five or $10,000 a year. So it wasn't a, a huge <laughs> sacrifice. Not, like today would be, today, today, I don't know if I would do, if I would do it. But right. It's different. <laughs> well, and, and you know, and, and when, when you say that, when you started, when they asked you to play that when you first got there, I would think there's a there's an easier buy-in for the player. And the first guy that comes to mind for me is Neil Brock. When Brock, yep. Brock was a 100-point guy, right, in Minnesota and things like um, up yeah. comes. Bob Ganey, Bo has a little conversation with him and telling him that he can extend his career if he wants to try, you know, to be yeah. the guy that you were. And I, I would think that the sell would be a little bit easier for you versus a guy that's getting 100 points, you know, and, and the other guy is Mo, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. Donald was in that similar role. Well, yeah, I think what what Ken Hitchcock was trying to do with Mo, like everybody understood what Mo was. Like he was, you know, an athlete, uh, big strong fast you can put points but like again like you know if you if you can score 50 goals a year but you're on the ice for 150 you, you know it works like you know you have to be able to kind of play i think and, and i think that's the, the hard part when i see the game today um i don't think if the young guys young players are willing to adjust to become a a, a, a more Rounded, you know, rounded player on the ice. Uh, you know, they want to do what they did good in the past. And, and you know, I, I always say, like, building a team is like building a puzzle. Sometimes the, the, the fit, the, the, you know, the piece that you have in your hand doesn't fit where the, the team thinks you could fit. So it, it, it is hard. Obviously, having 32 teams helps because, you know, those kids can go and, and try different things somewhere else. But, you know, I think in our days, uh, I think we were willing a little bit more to kind of adjust. And uh, I guess we had no choice because it was either that or, or you, you, you go down play. to the minors or you don't, or you don't play. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the studio clip the, that little part right there so I can play the practice today for our 17 and 18 year old team. Because it, you have to be willing and, yeah. and able to to adjust to the style like you said you can't yeah and, and and again i we see players come in these young kids and that seems like all they work on it you know but i i blame youtube for this because they all watch youtube and on youtube all you see is yeah. the highlights you know the zegrises and guys yeah. like the michigan and and now they all want to do that but they actually they don't have the ability to do it at the next level so like you said they we have to talk them into Dude, you can get to the USHL. You can get to the North American League, but you got to, now you got to start finding a role yes. within your within your club. You know, and you mentioned you mentioned a couple of guys I had, I had written down: uh, Bob Gainey, uh, Coco, Jacques Lemaire. I I always felt Lemaire. I, I loved playing for him. I think yes. I don't. Well, you obviously were in Montreal longer than I was. I want to say that. I was there for, I don't know what it is, eight or nine years, whatever. And I felt like I had five different coaches in there, you know, you know, <laughs> and, and, and yeah. honestly, the time you and I win our first cup together, it's with that coach, you know, it yeah. should have been Lemaire or somebody like that. But did you find Jacques Lemaire is a guy that, that really dug into the details of your game personally, yeah. like it could help you out individually yeah. more than other coaches? Well, I, I, that's what I thought. I, you know, over the years, I had a really good coach, but I, I, I still think that Jacques Lemaire was probably at the top. Um, I think he, he was a, a really good player. Uh, being a good player doesn't, you know, translate in being a good coach, but he understood the game. Um, he understood that, you know, players, some players are visual players, you know, uh, are native. Uh, you can, you know, some players, you can talk to them. 
and they understand right away. Yeah. Some players, they don't. You know, you have to kind of show them on the board or, or on, on the screen. Uh, I think he understood that really young. And he, he, there was no gray zone with, with Jock. I mean, he, he was explaining the play that he wanted to ha- you, you to, to do on the ice or, or the team. And there was no hesitation. You know, so you can turn around and go on the ice and, and knew exactly what you had to do which kind of helps because the game, the game of hockey is a fast game. Uh, if you go on the ice with doubts, um, you're going to hesitate. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's why we were so well prepared and, and it was so good. So let's talk about Bob Gainey. And I know, you know, I, I have said to people whenever they bring up Bo's name is for me, he was like my Scotty Bowman. I never played yeah. for Scotty Bowman. You know, I've, ta- I've spoken yeah. to him a few times, but but he both seemed to be the guy that was always teaching. You know, I remember we were flying to or from Quebec uh, one year. It'd be, I think it was after a game actually. And he kind of came up to me and gave me a little piece of paper and he wanted me to come back and sit with him. <laughs> had a couple, you know, I had a couple of beers back there and he wanted to talk about the penalty kill, you know, and, and you know, in typical Bob Ganey style is he, he'd ask you a question. You'd give him what you thought was the answer that he wanted to hear. And then he'd sit there and he'd look at you and he'd look at the paper. He'd look at you and he'd go, yeah. Uh, yeah. no. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so he'd kind of knock you on your ass right yeah. away. What, talk a little bit about the impact of, of, of Bob Gainey, especially the way that you played. And and Bo was the guy that basically that the Selkie was invented for, right? I mean, yeah. talking yeah. about points of forwards in the game. Like, what kind of effect and, and impact did Bo have on your career, do you think? Well, he had a huge effect, you know, first of all, like, just the way he acts. You know, I, I just say, like, you know, when I was – 35 years old, I, I kind of knew how the league worked, you know, what I had to do. But when you come up, when you're 20 years old, 21 years old, you think you know everything. But, you know, you need somebody to kind of show you the ropes a little bit. And and we had the chance to come up when we had Bob Gainey and and, and Guy Lafleur and Lyra Robinson and those guys kind of teach you and teach me how to be a pro, first of all, uh, and, and what you need to do to be successful. Uh, I think Bob was always kind of on even keel. Like he was never high. He was never low. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he was pretty easy. And I think he was the kind of guy that he saw, he saw the game differently than anybody, you know? And so he always wanted to kind of you to think outside the box. Um, so, I mean, you know, having him and I was always around him. Uh, I was his roommate for a, a few years so, you know, we talk a lot after games in the planes, on the bus, uh, about different things. Um, so for me, it was, it was fun to kind of start my career having a guy like that on my side. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny you say start your career. It reminds me <laughs> of something where uh, Hitch, Ken Hitch got <laughs> in the minors and he, he wanted me to call Richard Matvichuk and ask him, you know, if, if he wanted to come back here and play or whatever it was. And... And I, I remember Hitch's line was, I brought him into the league. I'm going to be the one that sends him out of the league if he can't play. <laughs> <laughs> one well, of those yeah. guys that just, you know, like the puppet master, one of those every players. And, you know, it, it, it's something that you, we're talking about Bob Ganey. And, and you got into coaching. And yes. and so now all of a sudden you're, you're coaching the Montreal Canadiens, which – you grow up as a young kid and I'm sure you idolize the team. And there, I mean, I know all the pressure in Montreal and all that kind of stuff. And it, I saw, you know, you coach for what was it? How, how many years were you in Montreal? Three, four coach? Three years, three years. Who, who, how did that end by the way? Who's, who's by Bob the, Gainey firing yeah. me. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's right. That yeah. the guy that kind of started it. That's why I, think yeah. I'm a hey, I, I started it. I'm going to end it for him. But, but I mean, how did that, how did you handle that? You know, with a guy that you looked up to, your roommate, friend, all that stuff. Well, I was like, you know, I, I was in, uh, obviously, after I retired uh, in Dallas, uh, I was hoping that, you know, the stars, because Bob was there, I, 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 I was hoping that Bob would offer me a job. Uh, that didn't happen. So I went back to Montreal, worked there three years for, with the Montreal Canadian. Uh, I was, at the start, it was supposed to be as an assistant GM. But then they fired a coach three, four months later and then ended up behind the bench uh, as an assistant coach. And then after this, the contract was over, uh, Doug Armstrong took over in Dallas and called me and said, do you want to come and 
be my assistant? And I said, yes. So I was in Dallas actually when Bob called back, uh, called Doug Armstrong and Doug came to me and said, listen, Bob wants to meet you. Um, so I, I had a, a meeting with Bob and he said, listen, I, I want you to come in and coach the Montreal Canadian. And I said, like, I've, I've never coached in my life. Like, I was, was going to ask you, you don't have any coaching experience. No, I, you know, I was behind the bench as an assistant for two and a half years. Uh, and, you know, uh, but, but, not the head guy. As, I, I, but coaching, I, I've yeah. never done. So I told him, I, I thought about it and I told him, listen, like, I, I will go back with you and finish the year. Uh, you can go behind the bench and I'll be your assistant. So that way, um, and, and he was put on paper that after the season, I was going to become the coach of the Montreal Canadiens. So that's kind of how, so I went back. You know, I quit, uh, left Dallas, uh, and I think it was in March, uh, when, or early January or February. Uh, and then, so I went to back to Montreal, finished the year behind the bench as an assistant coach. And, you know, once the season was over, uh, they announced that I was becoming the, the coach for the Montreal Canadiens. So that gave me, you know, a couple months to kind of, uh, figure out what I wanted to do, what I needed to do, uh, how to do it uh, and things like that. And, you know, I, I, it was fun. Like I, I really enjoy it. I know it was not easy, uh, but nothing is, um, you know, obviously dealing with the media, uh, when you're in professional sports is, is not, it's never easy, especially when things are not going well, but I had a blast. Uh, I, I enjoyed getting up in the morning and going to the, you know, to, to the rink and trying to figure out things. Um, that's what I love. Uh, it was, it was fun. Uh, you know, dealing with the players was kind of a little different. You know, I think when you're a player, uh, we think our job is hard, but like, it's pretty easy. Like, you know, you know, they tell you what time you get to the, to the rink, what time you go on the ice, what time you get off the ice, what time you're going to eat, what time you do this, what time you do that. As a coach, I had to take care of 25 individuals plus, plus the staff. Uh, and like, you know, like all the individuals, you know, they have, all have their own problems. So, uh, it, it was, it, but it, I really enjoyed it. I had, you know, I had a good time. I hired uh, Doug Jarvis was my assistant. Kirk Muller was my assistant. Uh, Roland Melanson. We got along really well. Um, I enjoyed every bit of it. Did you ever get frustrated? I, you know, it's funny, Bob, we're, there's a lot of things that are weaved in between you and I. And so one year, Bo had called me up. I'd retired. It was the, the, the year after we win the cup. I'm sitting in Wisconsin with about eight of my friends in December snowmobiling, two o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> and you know how yeah. that show goes. And I get the call from Bo, and he, you know, in his normal fashion, he goes, hey, I have, I have a plan A, but I need to figure out plan B first. I have no clue what's going on. Yeah. Also, he asking if I wanted to go to our farm team, which was in Kalamazoo and coach. And I, you know, I told him I need a few days, and ultimately I did. And I guess the question I have for you is, did you ever get to the point where you're like, how the fuck does this guy not get it? You know, the player I'm talking about, because like, I get it, but yeah. and, and how do you deal? Like, again, today, the kids are different today than they were yes. then. And yes. I have to, I'm in that world now. And I understand that when you're talking to a 17, 18 year old kid, you got to, you got to present it a little bit different. Well, a lot different yeah. than we did. <laughs> how how did, you, did you find those challenges on an NHL bench with, you know, kids that are going to play in the NHL? It, it was hard um, because, you know, uh, you know, like I said, and I think that's one of the reasons why I hired, I wanted to have Kirk on, on my side, on my team, mm -hmm. because Kirk, Kirk is really good, you know, to talk with people. Uh, he's, he was, you know, like I said, I always say this, you, you put Kirk Muller in a bus of uh, with nobody that he knows. And an hour later, he knows everybody. And I guess that's the way he is. And, and I think I, I know that I don't have that in me. So I needed somebody to, to, to do that. So like, so I was able to kind of figure it out a little bit, but there was time where it was really hard um, because, you know, as a coach, your, your job, the your first job is to try to win or, you know, you are winning. Uh, so to do that, sometimes you have to push the right button and the right button sometimes is not always a tap in the back. Sometimes it's just, you know, you have to kind of put somebody on the bench or somebody in the stands and, uh, and most of the times they don't understand why you're doing this. So you, you kind of have to explain to them, but even when you explain it to them, 
they still don't understand because right. it, because they were like us you know they were all the kids that play in the nhl now they used to play 20 25 minutes sometimes for a defenseman 30 minutes a game and they're playing with most of the you know that's the teams they go to a junior championship they go somewhere like they, so they always kind of they always they, that guy and then yeah. all of a sudden they get to the you know nhl where everybody is the guy Yep. Like, and, and they don't get it. They don't understand it. And, and so uh, you do have to explain to them, uh, but it, it's a, it's a hard, and, and I don't know, like, I don't know what the right, the right recipe is. You know, I've, I've, you know, us like yeah, I'm, we're in the age where we've seen a lot of it before things are changed. Yes. Coaches have changed. Uh, teams have changed. The, the philosophy has changed. But at the end of the day, it's the same game. And, and uh, I don't know anybody in any league that are a job for life because there's always somebody that decide, and, you know, they, they offer those eight-year contracts with players, and they're the one that controls what's going on. That's exactly right. And I, I've always felt like, you know, they, you have your coaching staff, and I just, I, like you said about Kirk Muller, and, and Kirk, he was the perfect assistant coach and I always yeah. felt the assistant coaches were as important sometimes more important than the head yes for the buffer between the head guy and the players and when yes. Kitch, Rick Wilson to me and I had Rick Wilson uh coach here in Dallas uh you know I had Rick Wilson in college and he's that guy when and you have the head coaches that snap and they lose their shit and they, <laughs> yeah. you know, but he would be the guy that would come in and talk to you after that happened and and he would kind of he would explain it in a different way so he kind of walk you back down a little bit and i've always felt that those guys are i look at rick bonus and i, I think yeah. i think it's got to be hard going from being a an assistant, assistant to the head coach. Sudden you yeah. got to be the, you got to be the dick yeah right? yeah because like you know I, I when i was a coach everybody said like i told everybody he said listen if, if any of you guys have problems or want to discuss something my door is always open and my door was always open but not everybody wants to talk to me they want to like, you know, so you always, you know, you got 23 guys, 24 guys on the team There's you can only put 20 on the ice. And then there's, so there's always two, three, four guys that are extras that are skating. And who did they go to talk to? They go talk to the assistant coach. Yeah. Uh, you know, I bought their problems, why I don't play. And if the assistant coach doesn't say the same message that the, that the coach does, then you're dead. Yeah. So yes, you do. You do have to have solid assistant, you know, that translates what you're trying to do on the ice to the other guys. And it's shitty. They make four times less the money that the head guy does, and they're they're the ones. <laughs> control all that, right? Pretty um, much. Pretty much. So, so then, what are your thoughts on on Martin Saint Louis? You know, he comes into Montreal. Montreal is obviously in. You know, I don't know if you want to yeah. call it retool, rebuild, whatever the polite way is to say it. Um, so how do you, how do you think he's, I know he, you know, he came in last year. Now he's going to, you know, they, yeah. I, did they give him a two, three year deal or what? Yeah, what three year, I think. Yeah. Three year, how, do you, how do you think, what's his approach that you see? Well, <clears throat> you know, I think everybody was kind of surprised uh, when they heard that they were going to hire him. Uh, you know, he had no initial experience like me, but like, I think the, the, the road that he took to, to make it into the NHL was, um, was pretty amazing. So I think everybody was willing to give him a chance and he, and he took it. I think, you know, obviously they didn't win games uh, more than uh, Dominique Duchamp was winning. Yeah. So that, that part, but I think he brought something new. Uh, I think his vision of the game is a little different than, you know, most of the guys think about, um, which is interesting. Like he spoke pretty well, uh, you know, after, but there was no pressure to win. Right. I mean, none, zero. Right. So all he, all he said, you know, was the right thing. Now, now I, it's going to be interesting. Um, you know, I think I'm going to judge, I, you know, over the, over the time, over the years as an athlete, you know, people ask me a lot of questions about this players or that players or this coach or this coach. And I'm always said the same thing. Like, listen, you know, you can have one really good year. Uh, I'd rather wait and see if he can make it long-term to discuss if he's, you know, 
if he's worth it. And and that, I'm going to say the same thing with Martin Saint Louis. I, I I wish him well. I think he's got the right right tools. Uh, he's, he's got a good mind. Um, there's good vision. Now he needs to put that on the team and and start to win. Does Maybe he have not a good assistant year. coach. Well, he's got young guys. Uh, you know, I think Stefan Rabida was a good hiring. Yep. Uh, but again, uh, he, no experience in the NHL. Uh, Alex Gurros, you know, had a couple of years behind the bench as a NHL. But you know, he, but like if he's surrounded. You know, if they bring the the right thing, like I think Montreal Canadiens gonna are in on the rebu rebuilding side, kind of. So you know, I, I don't see how in the next couple of years, you know, they're gonna be a championship team. But you know, if you can do it, if you can if you can bring it up, like uh, just a little bit more, uh, is gonna be you know, that's gonna be a good start. Uh, I think, you know, we saw something more exciting last year when he came up, but now that the pressure is there to win, uh, we'll see how he reacts. Do you, do you think that, and the fans in Montreal are so knowledgeable, we'll get off Montreal here in a second. It's just, I, you know, again, I was kind of weak <laughs> there and I, I, I love the city. I, I love yeah. the organization, yep. but, but, I, and the fans are so knowledgeable and this will lead me into my next thing. I mean, you look at Montreal, we talk about St. Louis, how the team's going to be and thing like that. You lose a, a franchise goaltender, probably. I mean, Carey Price yeah. it sounds like Carey's done. Your yeah. captain, Shea Weber, big, strong defenseman, he's done. They feature on. Pacioretty moves on. You know, so there's a there's a lot of bullets that are out of that yeah. holster. And then playing in the in that environment, do you think the fans understand that, or do they want a fix? Well, I mean, we'll, we'll figure it out because they, you know, the last. I mean, you know, the last Stanley Cup was in 93, so here in, in, in Montreal and in Canada. So that's a long, long time ago. Long time. Uh, but, like, they never went that path. So I think, I, think the, the, I, I, think, I would think that people are willing to kind of be patient if that's what they want to do. But they're still going to have to see some results. You know, I think Nick Suzuki is a young guy that, you know, kind of came up and... and for the last couple of years was exciting to, to watch. Cole Cofield had a, you know, bad start, but he finished really well when uh, Martin Saint-Louis came up. We'll, now we need to see him keep going. Uh, there's a couple of young guys on defense. Uh, you know, obviously losing carry is going to be unbelievable. Like, I don't know how they're going to be able to replace. They're going to have to find somebody, not for this year, but for the next three, four years, because I, I would imagine uh, in three, four years, that's when you're going to see the Canadians be uh, willing to or ready to win. So they're going to have to find a goalie. But it's the same thing. Like for the last four, 15, 15 years, 10 years, they give us, you know, they say, oh, we got to have a good team. We're going to have some good defense or good offense and nothing happened. So, um, you know, I, I think... I like what Kent can use and Jack Gordon is, are doing. Uh, I think they're willing to be a little different and, and they made some good moves so far. Uh, now it's, he needs to start to paying off. So you talk about moves last one here in Montreal, you wore the C in Montreal for what? Yeah. Five years or so yep. uh, in that market, being French, being the guy, Guy Lafleur was there a long time ago when you and I started, and there were the chance of Guy, Guy, Guy in there. Next thing you know, he's gone, and now they're starting chanting Guy, 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 meaning you. A little pressure, I would assume, for that. <laughs> but but talk about, and the reason I'm going here is because you brought up Nick Suzuki. Now, yeah. Montreal hasn't had a captain. You know, Shea's been gone. They put the C on him. Your thoughts on wearing the C in Montreal and two different things. Giving the C to a young player, yeah, and then giving a C to the young player in Montreal that I would assume will be taking some French lessons because you need to be able to say a word or two yeah, in French yeah. if you're in Montreal, correct or not? Yeah, I, I, I think you know I was kind of well not disappointed that that they didn't uh, they didn't give the the C when you know last year. You know, I, I think a team without a C is I don't like it, uh, but I think they wanted to wait and, and, and look at Nick, you know, how he would, uh, 
go through the year? How he would react? Uh, you know, can he handle the pressure? Um, you know, I, I think three, four years ago, I would have given it to Brendan Gallagher. Uh, I think it's a good thing that they maybe wait to see because Nick just signed an eight year contract. He's the he's face of the, the team right now. Uh, he's playing extremely well. He's saying the right things on and off the ice. So I think it was the, the right move to, to give it to him. Uh, now, uh, like I said, like he's, he's had three years in the NHL. Uh, I think he's, uh, he's, you know, he's been, he's been pretty solid, uh, for the French things. Uh, I, I, I hope for him that he's, he takes some lessons. I mean, you know, um, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't want to do it. Uh, it's important. He, 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 it's important. It is. It is. It's important. It's important because he's, he's the, the face of the, the team. Uh, I think he's going to have to kind of talk to the, the to the reporters, not every day, but because you don't have to, but every day. But, you know, when things are going sideways, sometimes uh, you, you're, they're going to ask, they're going to ask him questions. And there's not, you know, there's a bunch of uh, uh, English reporters, but, you know, uh, 80% or the, the, the people that follow Montreal Canadiens are French. So, they, you know, they, he's going to have to say some words. Do you get, uh, definitely. Do you, get, do you get a phone call or do you get anybody that asks you to say, hey, we're, you know, here's what we're going to do. You've been in this position here. You understand Montreal. You, you know, you're, you're doing media and things like that to come in and maybe help a kid like that? Well, I, I, we'll see. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, I mean, we can't, Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon, maybe they will. Uh, they didn't. They didn't in the past. Uh, they didn't do it. They did, I don't know why. Uh, I think you know. I'm not the only one. I think there's a bunch of us here in Montreal that are willing to help this team. Um, so, but you know, we're not. We're not. We're not going to go knock on on their doors. To, they got to yeah. lock to knock on our our doors. But uh, you know, at, at at the we had the golf tournament. Uh, Earlier last week, uh, we had a chance to meet those guys. I talked to them a little bit. Um, hopefully, you know, it'll, it'll be more this year. And if they they need to me to go and talk to some of the guys, uh, the door is always open. So, uh, yeah. So what are your thoughts then uh, in general? Because it happened with you and Shelly, having two captains or co-captains, whatever. Yeah. I, I, I don't understand that part. And then follow up on that with, on the other end of the spectrum, and Blake Wheeler comes to mind. We know what happened to Blake Wheeler here a couple yeah. of days ago. You take a veteran that's been wearing that C for, I don't know what he's been wearing it for, eight, nine, ten years or whatever it is. And Mike Badano was in the same situation. Yeah. You got these guys that have the C's on, then all of a sudden somebody in management comes in and takes it away from you. Like, what does that do? Well, I mean, it d- d- depends on, on the situation. I mean, uh, like, you know, I, we, we've talked about that a little bit here in Montreal on, t- on television the last couple of days uh, after that happened. Uh, you know, uh, the, the thing is, is like, we don't know what happened in the background. Uh, I don't know Wheeler's a lot. Uh, I don't know what's going on in Winnipeg. Uh, you know, I, I think over the years, there's different philosophy about the captaincies. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, some teams want to put the right guys. Uh, I think when Jonathan Taze came up, there was no, you know, there was no doubt that he was going to be the captain. Sidney Crosby was the same way. Uh, you know, there's guys that are born to be, <laughs> to be leaders. Yep. Uh, some guys are not. And, but it happens that they're the best players on the team. And, you know, the, I think not just in the States, but the star, you know, we need the star. We need somebody. To, <laughs> and and I, sometimes they put they put the C on their best players, but it's not the right person. They don't need know? that extra pressure. They're already supposed to put up forty goals on hundred points. Exactly. And now, right. And they and they need and they need to they need to be able to be the voice of the players. Mm-hmm. You know, they they're the buffers between the players and and the the organization. Uh, you know, they need to be able to kind of you know, not fix things because you're not there to fix things, but to help, you know, to, to make, to bond, bond those guys. And, and so, I mean, there's, there's responsibilities that are there that some people are not willing to do. And in the past, it wasn't uh, a huge thing, but now it is. 
you know, with the money part, the the pressure that the players have, the pressure that the teams have to to perform. You know, I mean, it, it's you can say like, you know, everybody has pressure now. I mean, the owners, you know, pays six, seven, eight hundred million dollars for franchises, so they put a lot of pressure. And they so they hire a, a GM. They give him a lot of money, so they put a lot of pressure on the GM. The GM hires a coach, then they put a lot of pressure on the coach, and then they, they you know, so it it goes down pretty hard. So you need to kind of have somebody with solid head to kind of navigate in this exactly. Yeah. So so I I think and that I, I think that's why I think the Canadian didn't give the seat to Nick last year because they want to make sure, which I think was the right move. Uh, in Winnipeg, I think they gave it to Wheeler thinking maybe he was the right guy and he wasn't, or maybe he felt he feels too much pressure and went to see the, the organization and said, listen, I don't want to be the captain anymore. But so I, I can, we're I'm speculating right now, but like there's, it could be a ton of things, but, um, if it's not his decision, uh, even if he has four years in his contract, I don't see how he, how we will stay there. Um, right. Well, okay, so the whole captain thing, there's one more captain we're going to talk about here in a little while, and I'm sure you're going to figure out which one that is. <laughs> but I, I want to talk, talk to me about, because I know how I was, and this is why I say there's a similar little pass. You you leave Montreal and you go to St. Louis, and just like me, I went to New York. One year later, we're here. Yeah, here in Dallas. How did you handle that, the whole leaving Montreal, going to St. Louis? Well, that that was the hard part. Uh, uh, you know, I was the captain of the team. We just had won the Stanley Cup a year before that. Um, you know, I thought I, I had just built a house. I thought I was, you know, like everybody else. I thought I was in Montreal to stay for for life. Uh, I was going to play my rest of my career and finish my career there and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and then you get a phone call one morning and they said, do you get traded to St. Louis for Jim Montgomery? <laughs> so, Yeah. So uh, it was the day of, uh, of my golf tournament. I had a golf tournament uh, for to raise money for charity. And so that was a hard, hard day. Um, I didn't know what to think at the time. Um, you know, you, you, you wonder why. You kind of ask a lot of questions. Uh, obviously, there was no answer. Uh, nobody's going to tell you why because they don't have to. Uh, but uh, I think for me, it was, it was a good thing. Like, obviously, when I got to St. Louis, there was a lockout. So we didn't start the year before January, I think, or mid-January. So that was hard, but uh, you know, it, it it made me live something else. Uh, um, I had a chance to you know to move from Canada, go live in in the states, um, and then obviously when Bob called the next year and say, "Listen, uh, I think uh, Bob Basson just broke his leg, and they need a defensive uh, forward." He called me and asked me if I wanted to go to Dallas. That was like a yes right away. And, and that that made it, you know, that move was easier to me because I went in a place, not that I knew the place. I didn't know Dallas, but I knew you. I knew Mike Keen. I knew Bob Ganey. I knew a few guys that, you know, um, so that made that, that move a lot easier. And uh, I never regretted it because, uh, you know, I extend my career another five years. Uh, my daughters live in Dallas now. Uh, it's a different life. I, I learned to to live the American way, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and again, the Bob Ganey name keeps coming up, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was always in, the, in New York. I got a phone yeah. call in the summer. Hey, would you be interested in you know, Minnesota? Yeah. And I'm like, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah, that's right. and, you know, again, it's about having a plan B before he puts in plan A into action. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, I give him so much, obviously, all the credit to, to building that team that we had in 99. So so now you go from St. Louis. The good news is you get to, you get to figure Brett Hull out before he yeah. came here. <laughs> what we were dealing with when Hully came here. So you leave there. <clears throat> you come to Dallas. And... Your thoughts when you first came here? I mean, first looking around the room. I mean, yeah. you're talking about Mo and Nui. I mean, yeah. guys like this. You know, I mean, your thoughts when you came here? Well, I, I think, you know, I, like you said, I think the, the the name that comes back is Bob Gini. And I think kind of Bob had, had that idea and his vision to kind of same thing that Jock had when, 
we start, I started in Montreal, like his vision to build a team. He wanted to have guys that won before. I think that's the reason why he got you and me and Mike Keane and a couple of guys to kind of surround the talent that he had before. You know, I think they had, you know, when, when I, when I got to Dallas, you know, Mike and Yuri Lettinen and uh, Jamie Langerbrenner, there's, there's a couple of young guys that were, you know, had talent. They just needed to be surrounded by veteran and, and guys that had a chance to win before. And, and I think that's what it was. So I, for me, that was, I was fun. I was at the time in my career, I was 35 years old, you know, uh, I've seen it a lot and I've done a lot, but you know, it was kind of exciting to, to not, to go to a place where I was not the center of attention, uh, that I, you know, that would have fun just playing hockey and, and trying to build something that, never been done which is you know winning a Stanley Cup in Texas <laughs> did you did you uh, ever expect coming to Dallas Texas and then hearing the gee 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 chants coming down from the fans here in Dallas like they were in Montreal <laughs> well I mean I, I I've always I always want on you know every time I step on the ice I was trying to you know my, my thing here in Montreal like I knew how hard it was to play here so my thing every time I jump on the ice was to work as hard as I could. So I didn't hear my, you know, I didn't see my name in a bad ways in the paper or I yeah. didn't want it. I didn't want anybody to talk badly about me. So uh, I try to play hard every time and I was no different in Dallas. Um, I didn't expect at the end of my career to have the same expectation or the same role, which was fine. Uh, but, you know, I had, uh, I had, you know, it was enjoying. It was fun. Yeah. Well, the, the good news about coming from places like Montreal to Dallas is here there was only one reporter. You know, exactly. You worry about it. In Montreal, yeah. it's the Bible. I remember it was called the Journal. Yeah. And and I didn't read French at the time when I was there. Obviously, in the beginning, and I remember somebody saying, you know, this is they know what you did at practice. They know what you did on the bus. You know what yeah. your what the route that you took home. How many nights were you at Cheers and how many beers did you drink and all that other kind of bullshit. Yeah. I get up in the morning not knowing a damn thing. I get that paper and I just scour it and I just look for my name. And if I ever found my name, <laughs> hey, what what did I do wrong here? So yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, that was the difference when you come here. So now we come here, we we have a really good team. Obviously, yeah. we, we go on, we win. Bob Ganey's the the guy behind the curtain again. Ken Hitchcock comes in. Your thoughts on playing for Hitch? Well, I, I enjoy it. I, I, you know, I think I never had problems with any coaches except maybe Bob Berry when I started my career because, you know, I was young uh, and I was eager and I wanted to play. And I, I felt, I don't know, it, it wasn't fair with me because I wasn't playing a lot. But, you know, I, I, as I grew older, you know, I think I understood why he was trying to do that. You know, you were, I was a kid. Uh, they had, you know, they had, won four in a four Stanley Cup in a row from 60, 76 to 80. So I think there was guys on the team that they, they, they rely on more than, than me. Uh, so, but when I got to Dallas, you know, I was, like I said, like I was 35 years old. I've done, I had two Stanley Cup. Um, I was comfortable with who I was. Um, and, you know, I mean, I just I understood that Hitch was doing everything to try to win. Um, which was the good part. I think as, you know, as a hockey player, um, I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to win every year. So like, you know, I didn't, I didn't mind the pressure and I didn't mind, but you know, there was, there was things that, um, and you, you were there. I mean, there was things that happened with Hitch that, you know, no, like a lot of people didn't like, but you know, it kind of, I, I think it was harder on, on the young guys because they didn't have the experience that we had and they didn't know how to react, to react. They didn't know how to respond. Um, I think we had a pretty good idea. And so I, I had a, you know, I, and it goes back to, you know, who I was like every year that I was in Dallas, when Ken, Ken was there, we had the same argument after the year. Like, you know, I was, I, was, I wanted to play one more year. Uh, I, I was taking it year by year at that time. And, you know, we had the discussion Said, so, well, you know, I don't know if you're going to be uh, able to play every game next year. Uh, we got young kids coming in, blah, blah, blah. I said, and, I, and my thing was always the same thing. I said, listen, don't worry about this. I'll, I'll train. I'll come out. You do what you have to do. I'll do what I have to do. Yeah. I, I know, I know what, what role I have to do. So that was kind of easy for me. 
Um, but we had we had some instance where you know we didn't see eye to eye, and uh, we had good good discussion, and and that was it. You you don't know all the behind the scenes that Craig Lemberg had to deal with with Ken Hitchcock. So I I, I know exactly what it is, and I know good, and I and I'm a huge fan of Hitch and yep. I appreciate it. And what I liked the most about Hitch, I felt Carbo was that he treated the superstars the same way he treated guys like me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it seemed like everybody was equal to him. And I appreciate yep. that because we, we went through the, I remember so many plane rides and at the end of the, you know, you're getting ready to land and the coach is going up and down telling you what time practice is tomorrow. And, and all I can hear is, you know, you, know, you look at the superstars, you got optional, optional, yep. optional, mandatory optional in other words be there you know what i mean like one of the like shit yeah. it wasn't it wasn't like that and but there were so many mornings that i was in that office you know i'd get you know and come on yeah. in and this guy that guy and and even on the ice there was one one time i don't know if you remember this and our our buddy eddie eddie the eagle eddie didn't like the warm-up apparently that we were doing one morning and just a regular shooting drill warm up, you know, going back down. All of a sudden, somebody says something, and I'm standing down at the far end, and Hitch is there, and and I look down there, and there's Eddie in the. He, I mean, the drill just started. Eddie's in the corner stretching. He just leaves him that, and he goes and starts stretching. Yeah. Well, Hitch calls me over, and he goes, "What the fuck is going on with Belfort?" I said, "I don't know, Hitch." And he goes, "Go down there and find out." Now the drill stopped. <laughs> Everybody's just standing there. I skate all the way down to Eddie, and I lean over on my stick and I said, "Eddie, what's going on? You all right?" He goes, "Yeah." I said, "What are you doing?" He goes, I'm not going back in the net. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, this drill sucks. So I skate all the way down to the other end of the ring. I tell Hitch, yeah. Hitch tells me to go down and tell Eddie, Eddie, you go tell Belford, blah, blah, blah. I go down to the other end of the ring and I tell Eddie. And he says, you go tell him to fuck off. I'm not going back in the net until we change the drill. Now I got to skate up. Now they're, you're getting a little stick tap. Yeah, yeah. Because there's Ludwig skating back and forth, back and forth. And I just finally said, Hitch. Let's just change the drill. Now, we don't care. The guy just won a seven games in a row or whatever it was. We're good to change the drill. So, you know, he was always doing those mind things. And you, you mentioned a, a little earlier about, you know, you're going year to year and yet you your last year. Well, in, into the locker room, that last year, I believe it was that you played, comes this young 20-year-old something or whatever he was by the name of Brendan Morrow. That's and I don't know how many years later this one ends up being – your son-in-law yeah you're actually playing on the team whether you knew it at the time or not playing with your future son-in-law talk to me about the young brendan morrow because when we talk about captains i love these kind of captains yeah. they don't have to be big rah-rah guys they just go out and the way that they play is the way that they lead and i look at darian hatcher i look at brendan for me unfortunately for brendan i think he played so hard every game that he played and fought battles that he probably didn't need to fight, and I mean literally fight, yeah. he may have taken two or three years off his career. But your thoughts on Brendan Morrow, your son-in-law? Well, I, I mean, I, I always say that Brendan was kind of old-style hockey player. Uh, he would have been really good, you know, in the 80s and 90s when we started to play, uh, because that's the style of play you want. Yep. He, you know, I think he was uh, really good around the net. He was a, a goal scorer. Uh, I always say this, like Brennan needed to play with when he played with great players and he was, you know, with, with uh, Yuri and, and Mike Modano, he was a perfect fit for those two guys. He was a guy that, you know, could muck in the corner, get the puck out. Um, but, you know, and, and put the puck in the net when he needed to, but he had a good attitude. He worked hard, like he said. Um, and I was fun. Like I, I really enjoy his, his company over, over the years. Um, it was kind of funny when it happened, but uh, I mean, they're still together. So how, how, how did that, did, did he have to come and ask you permission to, to take Anne-Marie on a date or how did that? that well, uh, I, I think it came up. I, he didn't start a season with us. Uh, he started a season in, in the American league. And then yeah. uh, I think my daughter had a boyfriend. He had a, a girlfriend at the time. Uh, I think it came up early November or late November, something like that. And started to play with us. Uh, and then at Christmas, uh, we had a party for the team. Uh, they talked for five, 10 minutes. And then for the Super Bowl party uh, that we do all every year, uh, they, you know, they talk for an hour, two hours. I don't know. I can't remember. And then from that, that point, 
Uh, I heard his name a lot at home. <laughs> and, and and I heard her name a lot in the in the room, uh, in, in the dressing room. So I kind of put together, like, and and then at one point, I think maybe a month later, I knew they were going out together, and so I went to see him, and I said, "Listen, you know, it's okay. I know I had the chance to know you, and I know you're a good guy. So, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't think they needed my blessing, but it made it e easier and." Uh, like I said, like I, just the fact that I had a chance to kind of know him two, three months uh, before, um, it, it was it was awesome. Did you get any uh, questions or grilling from your wife Lynn about this kid at the time? Uh, there was a few questions, uh, and like I said, I, I think the fact that I had a chance to kind of know him, and you know, I, I think Lynn was coming to the games and had a chance to talk to him a lot too, so uh, it, it, it made it, it it went smooth. How about how about conversations as far as him when he when he does become the captain, like yeah. you know when you guys are do you have any of them or do you just kind of let him do his own thing? Does he did he ask advice at all about situations or? There was a couple times where he asked me a few things. Um, I think you know we had the conversation early when he, he took and and my advice to him was just to be honest and, and be real. Um, don't change anything. Uh, there's a reason why you you know he is who he is. Um, I would that's that's one thing I always try to do. Um, you know I, I I think you have to be honest with the players. The players are not stupid. Um, if you go if you if you go for beers and you're at the restaurant and you give shit to to you talk shit about the players or mm -hmm. talk shit about the organization or talk shit about the coaches and then you get into the room between periods and you start saying completely the opposite players are not stupid they, they're going to know that you're not telling you know what you think uh my my thing was always saying you know say whatever you say but make make sure you believe of what you're saying and and be honest so yeah you're, you're gonna walk you're gonna talk to talk you gotta walk the walk exactly exactly yeah well i'll tell you what carbo i i got one last thing or two last things here um okay one of the questions that were were asked the most, and you won three Stanley Cups, and I think the ones that hurt the most are the ones that we got to the final that year. We lost yeah. to Calgary. You got there the next year. You lost to New Jersey. Those are the ones that seem to just bug the shit out. Of it. You know, yeah. I mean, you'd be sitting there with five rings right now, right, instead of three. Yep. What uh, the question? What did you do with the cup? And and so, I you know, our first one that we won, they did the policy wasn't there, right? So we didn't get anything. We, we weren't able to get it home. You probably got it in Montreal, but I didn't get it in Wisconsin. But yeah, what did you do in Montreal when, when you did have your day or days with the cup? I think in 86, uh, the first cup we won against Calgary, I brought it to my hometown. Um, I was like, at the time, I think we had it for one day, like just an afternoon. So we brought it there. Uh, we had a you know, we, our family has a place uh, right on, on the beach. Uh, so we have tents and then a lot of people from uh, my hometown kind of had the chance to kind of come up and take pictures. Uh, the second time in 93, uh, like you said earlier, like I, I played four years in junior in Shkudimi. Uh This is where my wife's from. Uh, so I brought it to Shkudimi for one day, uh, having the same thing. We had a parade in the streets, uh, we went to golf, uh, the golf course. Uh, people had a chance to kind of, you know, take pictures with the cup. And uh, after I won it in 99 uh, in Dallas, 99, um, my Just dad. tell me what happened in Montreal. We don't need to talk yeah. about the Dallas part of it. Well, in 99, my dad died uh, during the playoffs. So um, so I had to, I was able to kind of bring it back uh, and to my hometown. And uh, so that was it. That's the only three. Well, yeah, let's leave out the whole mystery. Yeah, of okay. what, yeah we'll leave that. <laughs> um, last thing I got for you, Carbo. Um, yep. you, you are in a city with, you know, incredible history and, and legends of the game. If your last shift or your fantasy shift, who would be on your wings? I mean, you played and you know when you played with, and it doesn't have to be somebody you played with. Just curious, like, you know, all those guys that you know now on Montreal, like who's on your left side, who's on your right side? Well, on my like right side, I had you know I think Chris, I had good history with him, uh, but I I, had, I would have to say Guy Lafleur. Uh, obviously, you know, for six seven years, he was the best player in the NHL at the time. 
Uh, on my left side, gosh, uh, I, I, I would love to have Maurice Richard or yeah. guys like that, but I'll, I'll stick with Bob. Uh, that's right. <laughs> that, that's common for me too. Yeah. Uh, well, Carbo, I, I want to thank you for this. Um, you're welcome. I, I know you're, you're a legend and, and congratulations and you're one hell of a teammate. And the, the thing that stands out about, about yourself was I remember our first year and, and you had the balls in the locker room to stand up and, and say shit, you know what I mean? And, and, right. and things like that. And, and I'm sitting there going, uh, that's D LaFleur. That's, <laughs> that's Larry Robinson. And I'm yeah. over at the church house in the corner. So <laughs> but great teammate, great family have Carbo. I appreciate it. I really do hope that maybe when we'll you do that, in, we, yeah, uh, we'll do we that in a, Dallas. Whole, uh, a family reunion code of thing. We'll get in the studio. We'll have a couple cocktails and we'll live up to the Suds with Love podcast. It's a date. Thanks Carbo. I appreciate All it. All right. Thanks, Greg. Bye. Bye.